it's pretty exciting to be back, um, and I'm quite honored to have this opportunity to come and tell you what's happened to me over the last 25 years. Um, uh, when I first talked to my friend Ann Sheehan about this talk and what I should talk about, she said, well, just give us all a little bit of background of what you've been doing since you graduated and throw in a little bit of your science. So that's what I have in store for you today. Um, the thread that sort of follows my life from the time I was a graduate student to, to where I am now, it all goes back to surface mass loading. And in the beginning, it was forward modeling, and now we're using inverse modeling to look at climate and geodynamic applications. When I first started Ceres, I was initially working with Jim Wickham, and I was processing relative gravity data to study deformation in uh, Southern California. But after two years into my um, PhD, Jim left Colorado, and I, um, he told me, though, go talk to John Moir. He's new here. He probably has enough money to take you on. And John graciously accepted, and it's been one of the most important things to, to, to guide my research life uh, since then. The first project that we worked on was to decide how big are the surface displacements that are caused by the, pressure, the, the passage of high and low pressure systems. So 20 millibars or so can make the ground go up by a couple of centimeters. And this is a picture of um, my first publication with John, and I wanted to show you this. It's series publication 1214. And with so many scientists now that are part of series, I'm sure they don't archive the actual papers anymore. Um, the paper came out in 1987, and it was a theoretical estimate of the gravity change in the surface displacements that were driven by changes in atmospheric pressure. And over here, all you see is the atmospheric pressure changes at Boulder, Colorado, over a time scale of about 90 days here. And this is the predicted vertical displacement. So at the most, at Boulder, Colorado, we could maybe see two centimeters, one and a half to two centimeters of surface displacement. Now, a couple of things are important about this paper. One is that at the time, this could only be theoretical because we didn't have the techniques to measure how the ground changes, the surface displacements of the ground to a precision such that these things could be observed. But today, the um, precision of GPS and other space geodetic techniques is so profound that we can, in addition to being able to observe these displacements, we can also tell which surface mass, mass model is best. Another thing is that when people use GPS or other geodetic measurements to, to, to study geodynamics, climate change, or plate tectonics, sometimes the time series is too short. And to get the, the, the trend out of the signal, you, you really need to reduce the noise. So this has driven the geo geodetic community to produce loads and loads of models for su these surface displacements. In um, the early 90s, the International Earth Rotation and Reference Service established a geophysical fluid center, a global geophysical fluid center, and it serves as, as a warehouse for all of these uh, scientists that are generating these operational models for people to use as corrections to their data. And we produce models now that are related to atmospheric pressure loading, uh, ocean pressure loading, and also uh, continental changes in continental wa water storage. And I'm currently the chair of that uh, center, in addition to making sure that we're trying to produce the best models and the, the most up-to-date changes, apply the most up-to-date changes to the models, we also are concerned about putting error bars on those corrections. Right now we get mass models that don't have error bars, but we have to try and quantify that because it's very, very important for science, scientists to know whether they're adding noise or, or um, removing noise from their data sets. After I left, after I graduated from, Colo uh, from University of Colorado in 1991, I went to MIT and I was working with Tom Herring, and I learned how to process very long baseline interferometry data. The way VLBI works is you have a deep space radio telescope on one continent, and on another continent, they receive signals from a, uh, a, a quasar or something. The signals are very, very unique in time. You bring your tapes together, and you, know, you, you have to take notice of the time difference between the the, the signal being received at one station and another station. And using very accurate clocks, we can determine the distance on the, pla on the Earth of the, uh, the two uh, deep space antennas. Well, this is one of the first techniques that was actually uh, able to observe plate tectonics for the first time. And what I have down here, another thing that Tom and I did was we looked at um, the baseline data, because again, the vertical data, the vertical precision of these observations just weren't good enough for us to get anything out. On the bottom here, this is the baseline 
the Westford Vet Cell Baseline. So this is a baseline that shows the opening up of the uh, North Atlantic Ocean. And these are the predictions for pressure, uh, the effect of pressure on that baseline. And you see that the, the amplitude of the signal here is much bigger than the amplitude here. But using statistics, we were able to prove that it is a signal in the data and that we can get rid of it. Uh, after MIT, I took a short job as a contractor at the Goddard Space Flight Center, also working with the LBI data. And then in 1993, 1994, I was hired back by um, the National Geodetic Survey of NOAA to work with the Absolute Gravity Group back here in Boulder, Colorado. So it brought me back to Boulder, but it also changed my focus a little bit. Instead of working on geometrical methods to, to study how the Earth changes, I was now working with gravity to understand those uh, geometrical deformations. The other thing that happened at that t point, I, up till then I had been working with forward modeling. So we took the mass that we got from these mass models and we know how the Earth responds to loading and we know those properties very, very well. So we predict how the, the Earth surface is going to deform. Well, some conversations with John led us to, to consider the idea, well, if we take the ob observations of the surface displacement, maybe we can invert that back to get um, an idea of how the mass is changing. Now, where would this be important? It would be very important over Greenland. So it's happening over, the idea then was to put GPS receivers on the bedrock around Greenland. This ice cube is supposed to represent Greenland. And over time, as Greenland gets smaller, the Earth's surface rebounds just because of that, uh, it rebounds elastically because of the melting of the ice. We should be able to take these displacements and figure out how much ice has, has melted. Um, but in fact, Greenland is a little bit more complicated than that. In addition to those elastic deformations I was just talking about, Greenland is also uplifting viscoelastically because of the melting of the, the Pleistocene glaciers. And so uh, when you remove all of this ice, the mantle, uh, fluid in the mantle flows back to, to replace the, the, the pressure here and the crust uplifts vis viscoelastically. So we wanted to go to Greenland and the only way to, to separate the elastic and the viscoelastic effects was to combine it with absolute gravity. And this was uh, demonstrated in a, another theoretical paper of John in 1995. So John Moore, Christine Larson, and myself, we wrote a small proposal to NASA to install GPS receivers and take absolute gravity measurements in and around Greenland. The uh, GPS receivers and the field work were contributed by NOAA. And in the first year, in 1995, we installed a GPS receiver and we took absolute gravity measurements here at Kellyville or Kangalusuak. And then in 1996, we went to the other side of the island and installed it at Kulusuk. Um, the, this experiment we knew for a long time was going to take at least 10 years to complete, just given the, the size of the signal in the absolute gravity data. But this is a picture of the GPS from the um, eastern side of the island, the southeast side of the island, from the station at Kulasu. And the first thing you should notice is it has an upward trend. So this is saying that the, the Earth is uplifting around Greenland. And that makes sense. It should be uplifting because Greenland is melting, but it also should be uplifting because of post-glacial rebound. Another thing you should notice is that, oh, sorry, there was that, there are these, these trends here, is that the trend changes significantly in about 2004. And this change in the trend means that the, ex, the, that the melting of the Greenland ice, ice, ice sheet is, is accelerating. Um, but this change in trend, when we tried to explain this just in terms of mass loss, pure melting of the ice sheet, it wasn't sufficient to explain the, the entire change in the trend. And it turns out that the rest of that can be explained by the melting of uh, a glacier within about 100 kilometers of, of Greenland. So what we have here in, um, we have this 2001 line which marks the calving front of the Helheim Glacier. And then uh, we go back, it goes back a little bit to 2003, and then between 2003 and 2005, it jumps significantly. So there, this, this, the point, at least, of where the, the, the acceleration changes is marked in um, this, these observations here that was presented in this paper. But what we've been able to do in a, in a recent paper is we've used the horizontal displacements from, from this station to estimate the size and the location of where the mass loss is happening, and it does come from the Helheim Glacier. So this story has to do with absolute gravity as well. And on, on this plot here, I've plotted all of the observations of absolute gravity that we've taken at Kulasuk since 1996. Um, there. 
Uh, one of the first things to notice is that we have two huge outliers in the early part of the, the observation. This is the Kulusuk, this is the Kulusuk GPS antenna right here. And between 1997 and 1998, this hotel was built. So when you put extra mass near to your gravity receiver, it just messed everything up. And those two observation points just have to be removed. Another thing I wanted to tell you about this is that the, since I started by talking about what I've been doing since uh, series, is I moved to Luxembourg in here. So this is just to show you that all of these, this research here has been graciously supported by um, the University of Luxembourg. The other thing is that in 1998, um, I married o Professor Olivier Francis, who has uh, his specialty is absolute gravity. So he's been responsible for going into the field and collecting all of these observations and also doing the, the data processing and is really the best person to do this. This is the, the, the same gravity that we saw in the plot with, that, with those outliers removed. And um, the GPS data now, I've just averaged into 70-day averages that are centered on the, uh, the dates of our gravity observations. And what you see here is that clearly, as time goes on, these two curves start to diverge. So this is the GPS curve here in black, and the uh, absolute gravity curve is, is over here in red. I forgot to tell you, but I multiplied the gravity by um, uh, this factor here, which is called the free air factor. And it just means that if, if you take the gravity meter and you pick it up uh, over the ground, the mass doesn't change, but it changes gravity because you're further away from the Earth. And so this is, I just used this factor. It's not the correct factor, but the idea is just to, to put it, give it the right sign and show you what gravity should be giving us in, in displacement. All right, back to the divergence of these two curves. What we've, we've thought about this, uh, John and I, this is what we've been working on while I've been here these last couple of days. And the initial interpretation of this divergence is that it's telling, something, telling us something about the glacial isostatic adjustment rate at this site. And when we take that information and we apply it to what uh, we, we estimate glacial isostatic adjustment, what we get is that the, the, the uplift, the viscoelastic uplift at this site should be positive. And of course it should be positive. Twice the seen glaciers melted, everything should be uplifting. However, the current models state that the ground should be going down at that station because of um, the, the viscoelastic uplift, which has implications. So this data has implications for the models of the Pleistocene ice that existed at the, right before it melted. Anyway, we still have a lot of uh, work to, to do to kind of prove our case, but um, it, it's a really fun project and uh, we're, we're gonna get back to it soon. The last thing I wanna talk to you about that also has to do with inversion of data has to do with the uplift in subsidence of the Yellowstone caldera. The yellow hot, Yellowstone hotspot is considered a supervolcano. It turns out that the supervolcano has a specific definition that uh, it has uh, an ejecta with volumes of greater than 1,000 cubic kilometers when it goes off. If you look back in the history of the, the Yellowstone um, caldera, it's in the history that it does have these huge, huge explosions. So anytime us geophysicists see that the ground in uplift, it, uh, the ground in Yellowstone is starting to go up, people get worried and we have to figure out what's going on. This picture here is a uh, interfer interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar picture of the site, and it represents data from 1997, 1996 to about 2000. And it shows that the maximum uplift is someplace in this region here, and it's, um, the uplift is at a rate of 125 meters uh, per year. No, over, the, over those four years, that's what it is, 125 meters. But that's really, really fast. It means that if you're standing there, your hair will be blown back. You're rising up so fast. Um, and this is the, the paper, this was produced, in, the image was produced in this paper. And one thing, they conclude that the uplift is caused by, by magma intrusion in the Yellowstone caldera. Um, and they model it assuming that, it's, that the, the, it, the issue has to do with magma. Now, we're not sure if it really has to do with magma or perhaps if it has to do with the fact that there's water in the, in the crust and it's associated with this magma and that sometimes the water gets superheated so it causes the ground to expand. So our idea was to take, again, absolute gravity and combine it with uplift in, in Yellowstone. Now, if you combine uplift and gravity, you would expect uh, a, a factor of 3.2 millimeters per microgal uplift um, that's associated with gas. However, 
if the uplift is caused by the injection of magma, then that factor changes to about five millimeters per microgal. Um, so we started doing some observations in 2009. This is, this is a picture of the uplift from these three sites. This is Lake, the top one. This is Old Faithful, the bottom one. And this is Norris over, he over here, the Norris Geyser Basin. This is a, from the Yellowstone Continuous Network. It's a network of about 130 continuously operating GPS stations in and around Yellowstone Park. And it's supported and initiated by Bob Smith from Utah, Chuck Mirtens from UNAFCO, and also Dan Driscoll from um, the USGS Volcano Observatory. Now what you see here is that from about, it was flat from 2000 to 2004, and then again, from 2004 it starts to uplift but it also starts to subside at about 2010. At Norris, it's, it's flat or maybe perhaps subsiding a tiny little bit. And over here at Old Faithful, you have uplift and then it's either starting to flatten out or it's starting to go down. And the uplift rates here are on the order of, uh, at Lake and at Old Faithful are on the order of um, four centimeters per year or so. Now what I've done here is again, I've taken, uh, this is just, this is the same GPS data but I've only plotted from 2008 to 2013. We were there, we just got back from this, these field observations in the first week in September, and Olivier processed the data as best he could, but in fact, uh, a piece, uh, the, the polar motion data is missing, so these have not been processed as well as all of these others have. Again, it's Lake, uh, Norris, and Old Faithful. The red dots here represent the uh, gravity that's been multiplied by the factor you'd expect for, for, for gas, um, uh, injection of gas, and then the blue ones are from the injection of magma. And if you look at this, we're still not sure what's happening, but that's okay. We've written another proposal to go to Yellowstone for the next three years, and it's a great place to do field work, so I don't mind. Anyway, watch this space. It, we, we'll have something to say soon. So anyway, to, to just wrap up, I wanted to say that I started my career at Sirius forward modeling surface mass uh, loading, and that today we're using observations of surface displacement to um, invert for what the load is itself. We have to use absolute gravity in the two cases I showed you to interpret the observations in, in, in terms of post-glacial rebound or magma versus gas injection. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my husband who does all of our absolute gravity experiments um, and he does all the data processing. So I in fact, he spent six weeks in Antarctica. We're doing this in Antarctica and he's going back in uh, February to An uh, Antarctica. And NOAA has been very, very helpful. They provide the absolute gravity instruments. We don't have to bring ours, pay for shipping ours over to the United States every time we work in Yellowstone. And then of course, I'd like to thank all of my professors because uh, yeah, this is, they're the ones who taught me how to think about science. Thank you. Mm -hmm.